my middle school wish list looked like this. At the bottom were things like an invitation to Natalie's secret Santa party and student of the month, but at the very top of all things was my period. And yes, this is a real picture of my middle school diary. And now for those of you who have a period, you're probably wondering why on earth I would ever want it. But I did. So much so that when I was 13 and still hadn't gotten my period, I asked my mom for a uterine ultrasound. Because to me, having a period meant that I was part of something. It meant that I was capable of holding life inside my body. And as each of my friends began their periods, I began to feel more and more isolated. But finally, one fateful day in May 2012, I got it. And I remember it so well. I had gone to the bathroom, I pulled down my pants, and there was the bright red splotch I had been hoping for. And I immediately called my mom, and I was speaking as if I had won the lottery or something. Because to me, getting my period was like winning the lottery. But with the passing of each subsequent month, it began to feel less and less like winning the lottery and more and more like a nuisance. I had to remember to pack pads and tampons with me or when I inevitably forgot them, I'd have to take the single ply toilet paper from the public restroom and like <laughs> wrap it around my underwear like a cocoon and then waddle around the rest of the day with the hope that my poorly constructed cocoon wouldn't unravel. And as funny as that image is, it was moments like this when I began to feel isolated again. But this time, because I was ashamed. But as I became more comfortable with my body, and let's face it, clearly I am, I began speaking with my friends, and I realized they too had experienced their own version of the toilet paper cocoon, or even worse, the death of a favorite pair of white pants. And it wasn't just us, because people all over the world faced menstrual inequity as a result of these very feelings of shame and stigma. And though menstrual equity is a global problem, one example is right here in Arizona. I've had the privilege of speaking with State Representative Athena Salman, who introduced a bill last year that would allow women in prison more than the 12 flimsy pads a month they were previously being given. And though the bill didn't pass, it started a social media movement where people were mailing lawmakers hundreds of pads and tampons. And as I'm sure many menstruators know, a lot of these products still have a luxury tax on them, oftentimes making them unaffordable. And I did make my fair share of cocoons, but it was never because I couldn't afford them. And I realized not all people have that luxury, and oftentimes those who couldn't afford them didn't go to school. And when young girls don't go to school, that's detrimental to women's advancement in the world. And this expands across the globe. When I went to India, I realized how many people don't have access to adequate care. And then the recent Netflix documentary elucidated the fact that less than 10% of women in India use sanitary pads. And not to mention the sheer amount of stigma surrounding menstruation. My grandmother told me that when she was growing up in India, she wasn't allowed to sleep in the same house. She wasn't allowed to touch the pans. She wasn't allowed to pray. Not only this, but she had to wash the cloth she used as a pad and hang it to dry where everybody could see. <clears throat> and it wasn't just her. Her story is not unique. Women all over the world aren't allowed to go into religious institutions while they're menstruating or even go to school. And now I know hearing these stories can feel kind of debilitating because it feels like this problem is too vast and too pervasive to solve. But the moment that we start to think like that, it becomes isolating once again. So I believe these stories actually do the opposite. They unite us. They show us that there are people in every rural village, small town, and big city that believe menstrual equity is a human rights violation and an injustice that demands attention. And I have been fortunate enough to know so many of these people, and it gives me tremendous hope. So from here, what we need are policy solutions that reflect the ways in which menstrual inequity hinders women's advancement and human rights. 
And I want to dedicate my life to finding those policy solutions and advocating for these people. So today, as I stand here in front of you, I am as excited to get working on this project the day I was when I got my first period. Thank you.